pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our second lecture on classical archaeology and art history. Our speakers this evening are well known to the American school community. Emeritus a Professor of uh, History at Durham University, Edward Harris, Distinguished Scholar of Ancient History, and Sylvian Fouchard, uh, uh, pro professor of archaeology at the University of Lausanne and director of the Swiss School of Archaeology in Greece. Sylvian was a much admired Mellon professor here at the American School and Edward has been a significant contributor to our academic program as well, for which we thank them both. Now Harris and Fouchard collaborated previously on a very fine conference, The Destruction of Cities in the Ancient World, which was held here in 2019 and published by Cambridge in 2021. Today they share their recent research on the Marcus and the Deems, a new approach to the Attic countryside, and they emphasize at the outset that their work depends upon the many rescue excavations conducted by the Greek Archaeological Service, to whom we are all indebted. Now, please join me in welcoming both uh, Professor Harris and Fouchard to present on their work on Marcus and the Deems, A New Approach to the Attic Countryside. Professor Harris will present, and Professor Fouchard will moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. Kalispera. Αγαπητές και αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, πολύ αγαπη, αγαπητοί κυρία Διευθυντρία της Αμερικανικής Σχολής Κλασικών Σπουδών, ο Σίλβιον Φαρσάρ και εγώ επιθυμούμε να ευχαριστήσουμε αφενός μεν την Αμερικανική Σχολή Κλασικών Σπουδών και την Διευθυντρία της για την ευγενική πρόσκληση να παρουσιάσουμε uh, τη σχετική με τις κατεδίμους αγορές της Αττικής ερεύνα μας. Αφέτερο δε, τους uh, συνάδελφους uh, αδέλφους, uh, μας της αρχαιολογικής υπηρεσίας, τους ακάμωτος τας uh, αργάτες της uh, επιστημής της uh, αρχαιολογίας που σκύβουν τους ευλαβικά επάνω στην Αττική γη ανέσκαψαν τις αγορές αυτές και δημιουργούν εύσον τα ερευνητά τους καθή τόντας τες κοινή γνωσή για όλους μας προώθοντας έτσι πάντιοτρόπος την επιστημή και εμπλουτίζοντας αποφασιστικά την γνώση μας της αρχαιότητας. Καμία πρόοδος δεν θα είχε σημειωθεί Chorus to deco tus ergo. Messin corita yatus lathus, natu yatus lathi metus tonus. Now, I'll go back to English at any rate. Okay, good. In Aristophanes' Acarnians, Dicaeopolis expresses his nostalgia for the good old days in the Attic countryside and specifically for his deem where no one ever used the word buy and the land produced everything he needed. This passage has been used by uh, Professor Findlay, Thomas Gallant, as evidence that the market played only a peripheral role in the lives of Greek farmers in the countryside. This assumption has also led scholars like Astrid Muller and Robin Osborne that there is no evidence for markets outside Athens, the Piraeus, and Lorion. Now this view about the absence of markets in the countryside has been influenced by the idea of the famous German sociologist Max Weber that the ancient city was a consumer city and that most farmers in the countryside lived at subsistence level. The relationship between the city and the countryside was parasitic, with the city drawing rents and taxes from the countryside and contributing little to the countryside in return. In this scenario, the market was at best peripheral. This approach also represents assumptions about the relationship between the city and its territory. On the one hand, the Asti, supposedly composed of urban citizens and landowners who could walk to their fields and return to the city in one day. On the other hand, a Hora, made up of supposedly isolated farmsteads and small barring communities living on autarky, self-sufficiency, without need for supplies from elsewhere. 
Such models perhaps function to some extent in small polis of 100 square kilometers where borders could be reached in a two-hour walk, but not in Attica with its 2,400 square kilometers and its complex settlement pattern composed of 100 rural deems. Now these views about the uh, restricted roles of market in the ancient economy have recently been challenged by Alain Brasson in his important work published in 2007 and 8 in French and translated into English in 2016. And our volume, The Ancient Greek Economy, which integrates the evidence of epigraphy, numismatics, and archaeology, which was published in the same year. And here I must add on a personal note, I must say that this volume was very much enriched by my uh, contact with the uh, American School and again the wonderful community here and also I contact actually also with the Greeks uh, in the archaeological service uh, over the years. Uh, this volume uh, could never I must say have come into uh, existence uh, with all the things that uh, I learned and also uh, my co-editors also uh, learned from our excellent uh, colleagues here. Now in our talk this evening we add more evidence for the role of markets by examining the many agora which dotted the Attic countryside and offered regional alternatives to the Athenian Agora. Now, recent excavations by the Greek Archaeological Service have brought to light several deem Agora in the Mesogaia and this mining district, and the evidence has been well summarized by Olga Kakovayani and Michalis Anatakis in a valuable article published in a French, ed, French volume uh, edited by uh, Veronique Chankowski called Tout Vendre, Tout Acheté. In our paper, we increased this list to 18 agora, including several at the borders of Attica. Based on this new evidence, we draw up a list of features that constitute the archaeological signature of regional agora. They form large complex composed of open spaces or courtyards, sometimes delimited by walls and surrounded by buildings, and in some cases, a stoa. Rooms are often used for storage, cooking, and in some cases, craft activities. Now, one might point out that some of these features are found in houses and large farmsteads, but we believe the archaeological signature is different. The farmsteads tend to be smaller, and they don't tend to have a large rectangular space uh, in the center. But, and they also have another material profile, and one that most houses lack. That's the presence of official weights and measures, as well as foreign coins. Agoras also will include shrines and are therefore multifunctional spaces, allowing for the administrative and act, uh, economic activities of the deem to take place. But this is, of course, true in most agoras of this period. They're not just economic spaces; they are administrative spaces. They're also origin. They're also um, uh, religious spaces and administrative spaces. And of course, later on, they also get to be honorific spaces. We also argue that regional markets were significant exchange centers, easily accessible and well connected, thanks to an efficient road network that allowed for the quick movement of goods throughout Attica. Now, the existence of such regional markets as well as harbors boosted the regional economies of Attica and promoted the local and interregional exchange of goods. This was possible th thanks to Attic, the countryside's great vitality in the classical, Hellenistic, and imperial periods, and supported also by the presence of a significant rural population, which was integrated into social groups and religious centers. Now, moreover, by connecting regional agora, roads, deems, harbors, and the loci of agricultural expo exploitation on GIS, we use spatial analysis to show that each market had its own catchment area acting as a centripetal force for surrounding deems. While these regional markets boosted regional trade and production, they were also connected to the Athenian agora, thus creating a more complex and multifaceted web of exchange between the city and the countryside than previously thought, getting away from this model of the consumer city. Overall, instead of seeing a dichotomy between Asti and Hora, we support the vision of a fluid city-countryside continuum with a more diffuse network of secondary settlements, exchanges, and markets, and forming an interaction of systemic interdependence. Okay, good. Now, we'll first quickly, though, talk about markets in Athens outside the main agora. Uh, it's interesting because people think of the Athenian agora, but the Athenian agora, which 
excellent work, of course, has been done for almost 100 years now, beginning in the 1930s. It was not the only agora actually right in the middle of Athens. We also have evidence for agoras at Colitis, Kedathenaeon, Scambonidae, and Melite. They've not been uh, uh, either located or uh, thoroughly excavated. But what's interesting is that we think of uh, the agora at, in the, which is in the center of Athens, uh, again, providing for exchange, but evidently there was so much mar market activity and exchange going on, they needed four additional, actually, markets just in the center. Now, of course, the largest market outside the Athenian agora was the Piraeus. Although the latter was connected to Athens' urban fabric and therefore cannot be considered a rural market, it is nevertheless an agora outside Athens that deserves to be briefly mentioned because it was, to some extent, connected to the other Attic Agorai. We'll see this uh, in the rest of the talk. And it played the role of a major redistribution center. Now, during the development of the Piraeus after Salamis, the exceptional plan designed by Hippodamus um, uh, comprised a central market known as the Hippodamian Agora. This is mentioned in uh, Xenophon's uh, History of Greece. And it's the Hippodamia, the Agora and the Piraeus, or the Agora of the Demesmen. But perhaps most important for our topic was the harbor market in Cantharos and Emporion with its stoi, degma, money changers, and agoronomoi. This was where the largest volume of imports was disembarked and sold before being transported to the Asti and the Athenian agora, as well as other agora within Attica. Now, we come next to the agora at Halai Exonidas, and this is actually a uh, find within the last 15 or 20 years. South of Athens, on the road leading to Sunion, was a significant deem of Halai Aixonidas. It had six members of the council and then later ten, and is currently situated in Vula. During the construction of a supermarket, guess what? They found an ancient supermarket. <laughs> the rescue excavations unearthed a large complex measuring 22 meters by 22 meters, which is bounded by walls on the east, north, and south sides. The complex comprises a square courtyard measuring 10.5 meters by 11 meters, surrounded by 12 rooms of various dimensions, which open to the courtyard. There is an entryway to the entire complex on the east side. Near the entrance is a cistern for water with a stone floor. The rooms are wide with floors of packed soil, and in places the bedrock has been smoothed to form a level surface. The walls are made of local limestone blocks assembled in a masonry characteristic of the classical period. In the middle of the western side, there appears to have been a shrine with an altar where several terracotta figurines were found. One room displays kitchen facilities, perhaps a small taverna or food stand. In room two were found 27 bronze coins, some silver items, and a hoard of 11 bronze coins. Most of them come from commercial hubs such as Egina, Salamis, Corinth, Megara, Hermione, and the Theotic Thebes and are dated in the period 390-300 BCE. The two silver Alexanders from Colophon dated 310-280. to There's also a judicial um, allotment ticket with the name Dionysios Halius. Those, of course, from the Agora have been well published by uh, Jack Kroll in a very famous publication. Uh, and they indicate, on the other hand, there's also a lead weight with an amphora in relief and the letters uh, Delta uh, eta, mu, uh, omega, indicating the public nature uh, and perhaps the public character of the place. So this is a, this is a public, uh, again, uh, weight. The other uh, finds include fragments of uh, cups, lamps, iron tools, nails, and loom weights. The complex was on the outskirts of a loosely and widely spread settlement identified with the deem of Halai Aixonidis, well known for its remains of houses, streets, and small shrines at Kalamboka. The market and the deem were connected to the coast and a possible harbor at Kavuri Beach, as suggested by the recent excavation by the effort of an ancient carriageable road above the beach. Therefore, the agora at Halai supported craft activities in the deem and connected to the neighboring deem and the city thanks to a network of carriageable roads and also to cities around the Saronic Gulf through the harbor. And I think it's very interesting here uh, because we have uh, an excellent uh, picture uh, of an ancient road. Uh, Moses Finley was very dismissive of uh, ancient roads, thought that they were uh, too clumsy and road transport was going to be too expensive. But here we have a road from the classical period, which is, so is, is actually uh, very good, again, for uh, transport. 
And also, what's also interesting is, again, it goes right down to the beach. Next, we go to Besa, Sunion, and Thoracos. Now, at the southern tip of uh, Attica were the Lorion mines, which played a crucial role in the economic development of Athens in the fourth, fifth and fourth centuries. We currently know of five agoras in the wider mining district, which testifies to the high level of economic um, activity, of uh, production, and trade. One at Besa, three at Sunion, and one at Thorikos. Now, the agora at Besa remains poorly known. Polite records mention an agora in the deem of Besa, which had two baluta. This is a, a, actually, it's a small deem. It's situated in the northern region of the mining district along an interior route that connected Athens to Sunion. Kakavoyani mentions an impressive building made of marble blocks. And again, you see all that's been excavated um, so far, uh, which she identifies as the deem agora. Needless to say, uh, more excavation is going to be uh, required, but this, again, looks very promising. The deem of Sunion, uh, which had um, four and then six members of the council, is unique in that it had three attested agoras, not just one, but three. The first one was located on the beach in Sunion Bay, west of the fortified deem and sanctuary. And I think, and Sylvian's got it, he's pointing uh, to where it is uh, found on the beach. An inscription also mentions the usage of the small bay, Hormos, as a harbor for commercial ships and states that the ships must pay a tax to the sanctuary of Poseidon. In the 1920s, a classical building made of white local Suriza marble blocks, some 50 meters in length, was discovered on the beach. Oikonomaku suggested that this building belonged to the commercial agora of the deem. Another building was found nearby, behind the modern hotel. It's 30 by 30 meters and has an interior courtyard framed on three sides by a colonnade. Oikonomaku suggested that this building provided the political character of the deem's agora. Now, for the next one, we found that um, there was construction of a new agora in the deem of Sunion, which is attested in a very famous inscription, IG 2 squared 1180, dating to the middle of the 4th century BCE. The text describes the circumstances leading to the establishment of this new agora. Because the original agora was crowded with constructions, Lucius donated a plot for constructing a new agora, um, uh, two by two plethora, under the condition that it would be protected against illegal encroachments. The stone was found in the Suriza Valley, but its original location is unknown, somewhere between Suriza and Aguileza. So here we have another case of a Pierre Errant, a wandering stone. The presence of a market in the middle of the mining district certainly makes much sense, especially when the mines were exploited at full capacity in the fifth and the fourth centuries, and they probably employed at least about 10,000 people. The presence of an agora at the heart of the mining valley, well connected to the road network and surrounded by washeries and workshops, was essential for providing tools, wood, pottery, trachyte mills, amphoras, lamps, oil, grain, charcoal, and other essential goods, not to mention, of course, enslaved people. Now, we next move on to the agora at Pasolimani. And we know it's an agora because the street sign says so. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, again, there's a natural anchorage at Pasolimani, four kilometers northeast of Sunion. The complex, uh, located about 150 meters from the shore in an ancient harbor, is associated with a settlement in the area. It was excavated from 1979 until 1983 by the Greek Archaeological Service. The complex's dimensions are 56 by uh, 61 meters, with rooms on four sides surrounding an open central space. The entrance, marked by a marble threshold, appears to have been on the south side. Now, uh, Jung identified this agora with the agora of the Salaminioi mentioned in a fourth century inscription, but Ferguson identified it with the agora at Sunion. Now, the north side of the complex contains a stoa of 56 meters long with 12 Doric columns, which dates to the fourth century BCE. The four other sides were added in the third century BCE. The exterior faces of the wall are covered in plaster. The eastern side has eight rooms with remains of a latrine, a space for storage, and a room with a bath, a well, and a tank for warming water. Other rooms on the east side were for storage and contained storage pithoi. The complex gradually went out of use and was abandoned by the first century uh, CE. 
Now, the western side of the complex had one room on the south southern end where a rudimentary washery for metal was found with some channels for drainage. Other rooms on this side were used as workshops for lead products and iron products such as small boxes, pipes, and weights. And one of the rooms was used for the manufacture of Megarian cups. The rooms behind the stoa served as shops. Now 50 coins were found, of which 48 were bronze. There was one bronze coin of Philip II, one Athenian bronze coin dated to the fourth century BCE, 10 coins dated to the third century BCE, all of which are Athenian except for one of Antigonus Gonatas and one from Euboea, dated to about 196 to 194. 36 are dated to the third century BCE, of which all are Athenian except for one from the Roman Republic, dated to 169, 158, and another from Amisos on the Black Sea. There are two coins dated to the first century BCE. Now, there are many other finds, and these include one, large quantities of Hellenistic pottery, uh, litharg, lead objects and iron tools, especially pickaxes, and perhaps more important for the archaeological signature of an agora is the discovery of 13 uh, uh, commercial lead weights, of which eight are stamped and fall into the following categories. Double stator, square with a representation of a wheel, two squares with representation of two astragals, two staters with an astragal, a quarter of a stator with the representation of a turtle, and the half of one-eighth with the letters uh, tau, Epsilon Tau Alpha, and a round weight with the letters Alpha Lambda, one liter from the Roman period. So here, again, I think we do have, even though uh, we don't, uh, there's nothing that actually states this, I think this is a very good example of having all the elements that we would expect kind of for a rural Agora, but it's not the only one. Now, the finds from the Pasolamani Agora establish a clear link with the Laurion mines. The mining district reached its peak in production in the middle of the 4th century when the Agora was built. The Agora was crucial for importing objects to Sunion and the Laurion region, mainly specialized iron tools, food, oil, and charcoal. Moreover, the Agora was connected to a network of roads linking the harbor with Anno Sunion and the interior valleys of Suriza and Agrileza. The presence of three agora in the fourth century attests to the extraordinary volume of economic activity in the mining district. Now, the interruption of the mining leases around 300 BCE brought in a period of decay or limited exploitation, and this decrease in activity and volume of trade had an impact on the settlement patterns of the entire region. Um, and this has been well studied um, by, the, um, by Hans uh, Lohmann in his wonderful study of the deem of Atene. Uh, nevertheless, during this period of decay, some industrial activities still took place in the region. Some of the mines saw some level operation in the first century CE, and we know, thanks to Strabo, that artisans were still using debris from the older exploitation to produce lead objects. We then move on to Thorakos. Now, another point of entry to the mining districts with Thorakos, which played an active role in the exploitation and production of silver. The Deem Center included several mines exploited since the Bronze Age and included many washeries and workshops. A Deem of the importance of Thorakos, this is five to six members of the council, would be a natural candidate for an agora given its economic weight, the importance of its harbor, and its position within the mining district. Now, all the, although the epigraphic evidence is currently lacking, several scholars, including Margie Miles, of the uh, American School, who's uh, recently published an excellent article uh, on this stoa, have suggested that this famous, again, double-faced stoa could be part of the Deems Agora. But as you can see from the photographs, we only have excavations simply around this uh, double stoa, and there's been no excavation uh, around uh, uh, this area. And we, we, it would be very interesting, again, to kind of pursue excavations uh, around this. Um, so again, we may have, again, another agora. We go then to the uh, Mesogea. Now what moderns call the Mesogea represents one of the most significant and fertile regions of Attica, delimited by Mount Himitos and to the west, um, uh, west Himitos to the west, Mount Pandeli to the north, and the foothills of Panion and Miranda to the south. The region counted 20 deems in the classical period, about 20% of all the rural deems. It's well known for its agricultural production, rolling fields, gardens, and vineyards. Now, over the last two decades, rescue excavations by the Greek Archaeological Service have brought to light a wealth of new archaeological data. In fact, they revolutionized our understanding of this area. 
the uh, program of public works linked to the 2004 Olympics um, in particular uh, has profoundly transformed our knowledge of the region. Now, a new doctoral thesis on the Mesogea by uh, A. Bruschewitz includes a catalog of over 706 entries and provides a new landscape study of this region. For our topic, two or possibly three agorai can be pinpointed. First, the Deem of Oe. In the middle and center of Mesogea, a large complex of about 1,000 square meters has been discovered close to the modern airport in an area that appears to correspond to the ancient Deem of Oe. It, along the road from Styria on the coast and Braurine to Pianea and interior to Athens. The complex was constructed in the middle of the fourth century BCE, integrating a small temple of the fifth century BCE. This almost square complex had three wings on the east, north, and south, with an entry on the west leading to the main road. The northern part over, was over an old sanctuary and continued to be used for religious purposes. On the eastern side, however, was a storeroom with pithoi. The south wing has a large courtyard with a well in the center and a stoa, which was destroyed in the Hellenistic period. A furnace, apparently for metalworking, was added later. The finds confirm the commercial function of this part of the complex. Four commercial weights were found, a lead weight with a dolphin, that's a mina, a square lead weight with a tortoise, quarter of a stator, a square uh, lead weight depicting half an emperor, hemichitron, and a square weight with a representation of half a tortoise, hemichitarton. So there's no question about uh, the function of this with these official uh, weights. The complex is located at the border between the deems of Oe and Erkia, apparently at some distance from the settlement cores, but on the main road between the two deems. The complex has been identified as an agora or an agronomy by Kakovayani, Nazare, Leonis, and Anatakis. A link with the agora mentioned in the sacred calendar of Erkia has been suggested, but this identification still needs to be confirmed. We then move on to Mirinus. Now, the remarkable excavations conducted at the Hippodrome of Macropolu at Merenda have revealed the extended remains of the deem of Mirinus. This was six to eight members of the council. A fourth century complex with a stoa measuring 14.5 by four meters, opening on a courtyard, was built on earlier remains near the shrine of Zeus Fratrios. There were two rooms for storage, one with a floor covered by terracotta tiles. Much domestic pottery was found with several amphoras, including Rhodian and Canidian, lead weights, a lead judicial ballot, and a new style tetradam of the second century BCE. According to Kakovoyani, this complex was part of the Deems Agora, which had economic and administrative functions. C suggests that it ho hosted the Deem uh, treasury and the local agronomion, where the seikomata with um, reference weights were kept as well as Deem Judges de Castas in charge of minor legal issues. Now, um, we then go in the northeast part of the Deem of Mirinus, there's a large complex of 500 square meters dated to the second century BCE. There are 14 rooms. On the north side was a storeroom of 23 meters by 10.5 meters, which held pithoi and amphoras. On the southwest were the remains of baths and latrines, with the finds including pottery, bronze coins, and lead weights. There was some evidence for the production of honey. Anatakis suggests that the facility served as a transit point for goods moving from the port of Styria on the coast, actually, to the interior of the Deem and other parts of the Mesogea. It could be called what the French call a point de rupture de charge, that is, a place for offloading, where imported products from the port of Styria were brought to Mirinus before being exchanged and redistributed throughout the Mesogea and beyond. And then we come to Styria. The main maritime port of entry to the Mesogea was Porto Rafti, a naturally protected bay and harbor with installations, including an ancient pier. This great harbor provided an excellent alternative to the Piraeus, especially for serving eastern Attica. The Deme of Styria, which had three members of the council, was located on the northern part of the bay, connected to Miranus, the Mesogaia, Pallini, Athens, and thanks to the Styrian Way, one of the most significant Attic roads. Now, a large Roman building complex with an earlier stoa was discovered uh, at Drivilla. The hypothesis of an agora has been suggested by several Greek scholars based on the plan of the building and the discovery of many coins, but additional information is needed to confirm it. And then we come to uh, Gargetos. 
We finally mention a possible agora in the deme of Gargetos, which was at the entry of the Mesogea when coming from Athens, just east of Palini. A deme decree for a theosos mentions an agora Kyria, but the only evidence, again, we have is this epigraphical evidence. We need excavations and more evidence. We then move to Ikaria. And the deme of uh, Ikarion was been identified on the west slopes of Mount Pendelicon by Arthur Miltoffer in 8 May 1887. Augustus Merriam, who was then the director of the American School, obtained a permit for the site, and the task was given to Carl Darling Buck, who was just a student, actually, at the time, uh, and who excavated from January 30th to March 19th of 1888, and from November 13th, 1888, to January 14th, 1889. Now, Buck published the results of these excavations in a series of valuable articles in the American Journal of Archaeology, focusing on the inscriptions, the sculpture, and the architectural remains. In, in 1948 and 1950, David Robinson published some more inscriptions found at the site. And in May and June 1981, William Beers and Thomas Boyd, with the cooperation of the Greek Archaeological Service and Vasileos Petrakos, conducted a program of cleaning and study. Now, as you can see from the plan, there are remains of several buildings and what appears to be a theatrical space. An altar is preserved, as well as a small temple with a pronos, cella, and possibly an adeton, which has been identified by an inscription, Ikerion to Pithion, which helps to secure the site's identification. Two statue bases with reliefs of Apollo and Artemis were found nearby. Now, the so-called theatral area consists of a line of six marble throne-like seats on top of marble slabs. There is also the remains of what appears to be public buildings and an exedra with a dedicatory inscription. Now, these are clearly public buildings grouped around an open space, which strongly suggests its identification with the Deem Agora. And this is a hypothesis which was supported by Franz Kolb in his book Agora und Theater, and also by Barbara Seelhorst in her very valuable collection of agoras in the Hellenistic period. But unfortunately, Buck reported only about the inscriptions, the sculpture, and the architectural features, and Beers and Boyd examined only the stones. The essays on Buck published in the late 19th century don't record pottery, coins, or commercial weights. Now, there's good evidence for the political, religious, and also dramatic use of the space, but we need further excavations uh, for evidence of the economic activities. We then move on to Ramnus. And um, the students, actually, I was there just last Saturday, uh, again with Brendan, um, and it didn't rain the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Further north, along the Attic, uh, eastern Attic coast, was the deem uh, Ramnus, uh, with eight members of the council, well known for its nemesis temple, garrison fort, and impressive remains. Two third century inscriptions mention the agora of the deem, so there's no question we have good evidence in the inscriptions. The presence of an agora at Ramnus, given its cosmopolitan population and its volume of economic activity due to the presence of the garrison and harbor, makes much sense. Now, the large open space situated in the center of the fortified deem, uh, which is, let's see, yes, you've got 13 on the plan, was been interpreted by Petrakos as the deem agora. And there is, as you can see, uh, an, a, a stoa um, on the southern side of this space. Now, the numismatic evidence from Remnus shows that the deem enjoyed many connections with places outside Attica. In volume five of the publication of the excavations at Ramnus, um, Petrakos lists 796, co 796 coins dating from 550 to 520 BCE to 335 CE. Now, out of this total, 490 are Athenian, 182 are minted by other Greek cities and kings, and 51 are Roman. Now, as Petrakos observes, the presence of the Ptolemaic coins can be explained by the garrison of the Ptolemaic mercenaries under Patroclus in the 3rd century BCE. Those minted by Antigonus Ganas can be, Ganatas can be explained in the same way. But the coins from other Greek cities clearly indicate the presence of foreign travelers who must have included merchants. And some of the most numerous are those from across the water um, and Chalkis. Three bronzes from the period 338 to 308, four from the period 290 to 273, 14 from the period 245 to 196, and four from the period 180 to 146. 
Among the other places represented are the Thessalian Koinon and Thessalian cities, 10 coins and 8 coins respectively, the Euboean League, a total of 43 coins, Locris, further up the coast, 12 coins, the Boeotian League, Eretria, and Karastos, a total of 16 coins, and Megara. Now, several places located farther away, such as Corfu, Acarnania, Lemnos, Metapontum, Colophon, Tinos, uh, Argos, uh, are represented by just one, two, three coins. Now, it's clear, though, that like Halae Axonides, uh, with the cities around the Saronic Gulf, Ramnus was also connected by sea with several communities along the Euboean Gulf outside of Attica. We now move to the north, to Decelea. Further west, along the northern borders of Attica on the slopes of Monparnas, we find the steam of Decelea. The latter is well known for its role it played in the final years of the Peloponnesian War when the Spartan garrison occupied the Acropolis and blocked, among other things, the traffic that, of imported goods into Attica by controlling the strategic Athens Oropos and Athens Tanagra route, as attested by Thucydides. Now, the Deem Center has been located on the Cotton von Attica, but has never been systematically investigated or mapped. A Deem Agora is mentioned in an inscription, um, and this is in the Fratri of the Decelians, um, a very famous inscription dated to the 390s. And it repeatedly mentions a central place in the Deem where the priest shall inscribe the decrees in front of an altar, which was probably the Deem's Agora. Given the strategic importance of the border deem along the main eastern route and the volume of commercial activity and imports, the presence of a deem agora makes a lot of sense and addresses the issue of border agora and border transactions in Greek poles. We then move on to Eleusis. Now, the large deem situated in Athens' local western border uh, on the main road to Megara and the Isthmus is well known for its Demeter sanctuary. Fortified in the 6th century BCE by Pisistratus, it became one of the most important deems in Attica in terms of population. It has 11 members of the council. And the seat of a garrison, it was equipped with an excellent harbor and well-connected within the road network. Eleusis was a cosmopolitan hub that certainly had an agora. And in fact, we have not just one inscription, but we have, as you see, three uh, inscriptions which definitely uh, talk about an agora and also talk about selling during the Roman period and also the use of commercial weights. Unfortunately, we don't know where it is. <laughs> Again, because all the effort, of course, has gone into the excavation uh, of the sanctuary, um, uh, we have kind of a hunch about where it might be. Um, possibly um, between the sanctuary uh, and the coast, but again, uh, more excavations are needed uh, to locate it. Then we go to the Mazi Plain, and this part of the talk was completely written by my colleague, Sylvia Fashar. I can claim no credit for what follows. <laughs> North of Eleusis, along the main carriage of a road between Athens and Thebes, was the Mazi Plain, located in the Ath Attic uh, Boeotian borders and exploited by the Attic Deem uh, Center of Inoi and the Boeotian town of Eleftherai. The strategic significance of this mountain plain and this highway was well known as attested by the presence of impressive fortifications at the Deem site of Oinoi and the fortress above Eleftherin. Survey and excavation work done in the Mazi archaeological project between uh, 2013 and 2017 by Sylvain Fachar and his team, now under study for final publication, has recorded crucial data regarding the occupational history of the plain its connectivity, settlement patterns, fortifications, and pottery distribution. Now, a remarkable discovery was made at the fortress of Eleftherai, a dry measure stamped with a signet ring of a uh, Boeotian magistrate that is stylistically similar to the unique Boeotian electrum coinage of the 360s BCE. The find is remarkable because the presence of the stamp suggests that it's an official measure marked with a seal belonging to a magistrate in charge of weights and measures. Now this would be the second official clay measure to be identified in Boeotia after a fragment of a liquid measure from Thespiae inscribed and custom made for an agronomos. Now, the stamped Eleutheri vessel suggests that we are dealing with an official dry measure. But what was the use of such a measure at Eleutheri? Official measures are commonly found in agoras, and these vessels are typically related to trading and commercial activities. In the case of Eleutheri, it was been suggested that the fortress may have been used as a customs house between Boeotia and Attica. The measure might also have been used in agora by officials to check weights and measures and their compatibility with Boeotian standards and measures. 
typically used for grain, uh, legumes, and nuts. The Athenian agora has listed, uh, yielded a series of 11 similar classical dry measures in clay, some with official stamps. Now this file re recalls a very famous yet complex passage from Demosthenes on Demosthenes against Aristocrates, which I translated recently, um, uh, where neighboring people used to meet in old times. This is called the agora ephorii, agora on the borders. Now, there are several problems with the interpretation of this, but some scholars believe that such markets existed at the borders of Greek polis, while others have pointed out that the term was not fit the conditions and the realities of the fourth century, um, since Demosthenes seems to mention them as something from the past. However, it appears reasonable to believe that such, situations, such markets situated in border deems of Attica might have played this role without being named differently. Moreover, we'd seen that border deem agoras existed at Ramnus, Decileia, and uh, Eleusis. Uh, we should also mention, uh, while we're here, also is the Amphorian at uh, Oropos. And there is definitely uh, uh, evidence, again, in a uh, honorary decree, which does actually mention an agora, and it's on the other side, actually, of the river, kind of away from the sanctuary, and it's actually been uh, identified uh, by Petrakos um, was in, during his excavations. Uh, what's, but again, uh, we, we're a little uh, uncertain about, uh, again, including this because, again, Oropos bounces back and forth between Thebes uh, and Athens. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's also, again, uh, again, will be a one right uh, on the border and obviously at a strategic place and also linked on the uh, roads, again, between Attica uh, and Boeotia. Good. Now, in the final part of the paper, we analyze the distribution of the agora within Attica using GIS, spatial analysis, and connectivity. And this is, again, uh, the work of Sylviane, who has actually been a genius, uh, again, with these um, uh, technologies. Now, so far, we've gathered evidence of 14 agoras with solid hints for another three. This means that outside Athens and the Piraeus, we have 14 out of 100 uh, rural deems with an agora, possibly 17, and probably more. Roughly speaking, we can postulate that 14 to 17 percent of rural deems had an agora, and we're hoping with additional excavations this number will go up. Now, the kernel density analysis in GIS shows the strongest concentrations of agora were in the agoras were in the mining district and in the Mesogaia. Now, this confirms the strong link between agoras, regional economic activity, and volume of trade, the exploitation of natural resources, and agricultural production. Not just, again, the production of the mines, but also agricultural production. We also find at least four agoras in border regions close to harbors throughout Attica, thus stressing their role as for uh, offloading and distribution, <coughs> redistribution. Now, we, uh, if we run a spatial allocation based on the cost of walking, we find out that the current evidence demonstrates an interesting distribution of agora within Attica. Each agora covered an area of about 124 square meters with a maximum distance of 13 kilometers, which means that nobody in Attica had to walk more than two and a half hours to reach a market. But on the average, the distance between agora and the limit of its drainage attractivity was close to six kilometers. Now, such a journey of two to four hours to markets is found elsewhere in the Mediterranean. And there's a wonderful quote in a, wonderful, an article on bond market days in the Roman Empire uh, by Ramsey McMullen um, from a modern Syria, which actually then, again, it tells you, uh, shows you that um, uh, small farmers are willing to walk up to three or four uh, hours, actually. So all these, again, agoras are easily reachable. It's actually even in less time, again, than that from all of Attica. Now, um, again, we also note that each market was positioned on major carriageable roads, allowing the easy flow of goods to the market and throughout Attica. This is also demonstrated by an optimal regions connections analysis in GIS, which clearly shows that the ideal connections between markets use the most important attic carriageable roads. These routes were used for transporting and exchanging goods between regions. Good roads boosted internal commerce and facilitated both imports and exports, maritime and terrestrial. The six main land roads out of Attica acted as trading routes, 
vibrant commercial axes serving dozens of deems and connecting Athens with larger economic hubs such as Megara, Plataea, Thebes, Tanagra, and Oropos. Small volume trade was also served by pack animals using a variety of roads, engineered paths, and trails. I just want to, one little footnote. So we think of, again, transportation of goods only actually, again, by wagons, uh, again, or by uh, by pack animals. What's interesting is in antiqu antiquity, a lot was also transported by uh, individuals. And we have examples of actually people um, just carrying things on their backs, actually going on a long, long, long distance. There's an anecdote from Aristotle. Rhetoric talks about somebody who was going from Argos and took a, uh, uh, took a collection of fish in a basket and went all the way into the middle of Arcadia. So it, we should not also uh, underestimate uh, the amount of goods uh, and, uh, that were carried actually by these uh, individuals. The presence of border deem agoras also highlights the importance of international roads for commerce. The main roads leading out of Attica were essential trading routes, and the deems found alongside them greatly benefited from their existence. Such important commercial axes encouraged economic interaction between the deems and other microregions, as well as neighboring poles. The route to the Amphiaran crossed the territories of nine deems, and in the 4th century and 3rd century BCE, the road was pleasantly lined with inns, allowing travelers to get some rest and refreshments. The road to Oropos connected nine deems along its route, including the border market of Decelea, which in times of peace might have functioned as a cross-border commercial hub, uh, the sacred road to Eleusis and out to, uh, and out to, uh, to the Megarid ran across a dozen deems, the two major sanctuaries of Aphrodite and Demeter, and the market of Eleusis itself. This was one of the busiest roads on Attica. The Styriaki Odos co uh, connected dozens of deems, including the markets of the Mesogea. The road to Unoi connected 15 deem territories before continuing toward Eleutheri, Plataea, and Thebes. The level of trade and exchanges along these axes connecting markets gives a good idea of their economic importance. Now, these markets um, were linked to other markets in Attica and places outside Attica, not only by roads, but also by sea. In the Periplus, Pseudophil uh, Skilox mentions seven harbors around Attica, one at Salamis, three at Piraeus, one at Anaphlistos, and an, uh, two at Thoricos, and adds that there are many other harbors in Attica. Now, as Graham Shipley has observed, there's another harbor at Sunion and a double harbor at Ramnus. In the uh, Demosthenic speech against Lacritus, the speaker mentions a harbor of Thebes, Thieves, excuse me, Thieves, not Thebes, <laughs> uh, which is not far from the Emporion and the Piraeus, and it's the subject of an excellent recent article by David Lewis of Edinburgh University. Estrabo also mentions this harbor and locates it near Psitalia. Dodwell located the harbor at the Mount of uh, Mount Gelio, and Leake placed it at Keratsini. Even if there were not harbor installations, merchants could also um, unload their cargoes directly onto beaches or use tem tenders, these are called lemboi in ancient Greek. These are smaller ships that could transfer goods from ships moored offshore to the coast. Now, the traffic along this coast was extensive. We have a very famous passage from Xenophon's History of Greece, reveals how the uh, Spartan uh, Tolutius raided the Attic coastline in 388 BCE. Quote, he captured many fishing boats and ferry boats sailing in from the islands, and having come to Sunion, he captured merchant sh ships, some full of grain and others of merchandise. So again, there's obviously a lot of traffic moving along the coast in addition to what's moving inland along the roads. In fact, there's so much traffic at Sunion, we saw that the citizens the deem placed a tax on cargoes, each merchant paying seven obols for cargoes over a thousand talents, and they had to pay an additional uh, seven obols for each thousand uh, talents over that. Now, um, we now come to another evidence for integration of the countryside. Uh, and that are the uh, horoi. Now, these horoi are boundary uh, markers which have been placed on a property to show that the land or building like a workshop with enslaved people has been pledged as security for a loan or other obligation. The formulas on the horoi vary. On some, we find the passive participle hypokemonai, 
of the verb hippokamai, which means pledge to security, followed by the name of the lender uh, in the dative. We have one here on one side. Now, uh, this Horus is unusual because it contains the uh, archon year of the transaction and the person who holds the contract. Most of these are not dated, but they tend to be dated in the early 4th century down to the end uh, of the 3rd century BCE. And then we have another one um, uh, which has a different formula which is sold on condition of release. Now, uh, again, you'll indulge me. This has been one of my obsessions for the last 35 years. When I was young, a scholar, I published a long article on this, and I've returned to the topic uh, many times. The, both the formulas uh, actually probably mean the same thing, and it's just like a kind of modern mortgage. It's basically as a pledge of security. You promise your land in return for a loan. Now, in a study published in our volume, The Ancient Greek Economy, I collected the horoi for which the fine spot is on the, known, uh, is on the stone and the deem of the lender was known. Now for 14 security horoi, the distance between the fine spot and the deem of the lender was about 10 kilometers or less. But for 21 horoi, the distance was 11 to 20 kilometers. And for 15 horoi, the distance was 21 kilometers or more. Now one finds a similar pattern in the Hecatostai records, and these are a tax that was taken on sales of property. And in his excellent publication of these inscriptions, Stephen Lambert has, finds evidence of 144 sales of land. In roughly half the sale, there's no evidence for the location of the property or the deem of the buyer. But in about 23 cases, possibly 25, if one accepts certain restorations, the buyer purchases property in his own deem. But what's striking, however, that in 21 cases, the buyer comes from outside the deem where the property is found. In a few cases, the deem of the buyer is close to the deem of the property, but in most others, the buyer purchases property in another part of Attica. Now, so again, in both these cases, we have, again, a lot of evidence for connectivity from not, um, not just Attica, the, not just Athens, out to the countryside, but also different parts of Attica with different uh, other parts uh, of Attica, sometimes a few kilometers away, but sometimes actually even more. So again, Athens, again, uh, Attica is a unified, actually, a market uh, for uh, land. It's not just people buying property, again, in their own deem. Uh, and we also should recall, in fact, that uh, Plato, the philosopher, actually was registered at Colitis in Athens and the uh, acquired land for the academy. But he also purchased land in the deem of Isistiade near Kifisia. And the politician Apollodorus, we know, had land in three different deems. Now, again, um, now, one finding that emerges from this study is that one should not posit a simplistic dichotomy between the urban center in Athens and the mining district around Laurion, with their concentration on craft production, and the countryside in Athens devoted only to agriculture with little or no craft production. There is no doubt many farmers traveled to Athens for its wide variety of goods, but we should not underestimate the production of non-agricultural goods in the countryside. And we certainly have found this evidence for this in, again, several, again, of these agoras. Now, the level of specialization of labor was clearly lower in the countryside. Uh, again, as I pointed out in an essay uh, published in 2002, uh, we have evidence for 170 different occupations actually in Attica. This number has been refined by David Lewis in a recent essay uh, and actually separating out full-time and part-time uh, occupations, but the number is still, for full-time occupations, is still around 170. Um, on the other hand, what's interesting, though, is that craft production is more decentralized, probably, in Attica than was previously assumed. We, again, we need more work, which will no doubt add more details. We come to the conclusion um, and one of my favorite quotes from Theophrastus. Now, Athens is exceptionally large, belonging to the exclusive club of 10 poles with the largest territories. This paper shows the Athenian agora was not the only marketplace within Attica and that small farmers and deemsmen were not obliged to go to a Athens to sell or acquire goods. Deem agoras offered a valid alternatives for products of daily need, making the journey to uh, the city secondary. Within one or two hours walk, anyone could have reached a market in Attica, and small farmers loved buying and selling items in the market. 
Here, again, the passage from Theophrastus. This is about the agroikos, a typical man from the countryside. When he's going into town, he asks anyone he meets about the price of hides and saltfish, whether today is the first day of the month. And he says, right away, when he reaches the town, he wants to get a haircut, do singing at the baths, hammer some nails into his shoes, and while he's going in that direction, pick up some saltfish at the shop of Archeos. This is not a small farmer who's living in self-sufficiency off in the countryside and having no connection with markets. It's obviously somebody who loves going to the market. Now, deem agoras were multifunctional public spaces, well connected to roads and surrounding deems, where agricultural goods, tools, specialized items, and imports could be bought and sold. Only a combination of archaeological and architectural features allows us to recognize them in certain cases where we don't have epigraphical evidence. Their complex is composed of open spaces or courtyards, sometimes delimited by walls and surrounded by buildings, and in some cases, a stoa. Such complexes may include rooms and shops, used for storage, cooking, and in some cases, craft activities. This material signature includes the presence of official weights and measures, as well as foreign coins. Agoras also include shrines, and therefore, they're multifunctional spaces, allowing for administrative, judicial, religious, and economic activities of the deem just in the same place. These spaces had multiple functions and can serve the names of the deem hark and the deem assembly for exchanging information and official news. In short, deem agoras were the Athenian agora in miniature. Thank you very much. Looking at the web, and there's no open question for the time being, so we have more time for questions from the room, if any. Yes. Uh, thank you. So, uh, I wanted to, so I wanted to um, visit the very beginning where you, you quote from Aristophanes and, and the Acarnians, and I noticed that um, Acarnai isn't one of these uh, agora that you've mentioned, but it's pretty distant from the surrounding ones. It's, it's at the upper end of your, your catchment areas, and uh, it's at a major crossroads. It commands the entrance to the plain in the northwest, and, and I'm just wondering, I mean, I know we're, we're limited by, by what we find, but should we expect to find one there? And if so, I mean, can we relate that to, any, to the point of, of what Aristophanes is doing, or...? Um, thank you for your question, especially about Darker and I. Actually, we, we have a list of good candidates for Agorai that will probably show up in the future, but we didn't want to, you know, extend ourselves too much. But uh, Akar um, and I is obviously uh, up there uh, for several reasons. First of all, the number of uh, Bulotai, 22, that we are there. So it's a hugely uh, populous deem. As you mentioned, it's one of the large roads to the northern borders of, Af of Attica. Um, the catchment region between, I don't have the picture here, but between Eleusis, uh, Decelia is incorrect, I think, and we need, we would like to have the space right in the middle. Uh, we don't have evidence so far. We have a theater, of course. Uh, we know more and more, we have more information about the deem, uh, but uh, the evidence is still missing for now. On my own. Yeah, I had a, a, some, a, some small correspondence with Daniel Kellogg, who's of course written on Arcani, Ar, 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 Arcani, and I asked her um, what evidence there is, and she says there does seem to be some kind of evidence for a deem center, um, and that's as far uh, as we go. There are some buildings which certainly look like public buildings, um, but there's not been enough excavation so far to uh, indicate whether there's any evidence for uh, commercial activities uh, in the same way that we're looking on. And here's another case where, uh, as with Ekarion, uh, again, this certainly looks like a deemed center, uh, but we're going to need more uh, excavation uh, to get kind of the evidence for commercial activities.
Thank you. Um, could you say more about the chronological development of the Deem Agarai? Are they all dated to the classical period? Are they all kind of bunched in a short time frame in that period? So most of the evidence we have from the rescue excavation uh, and the buildings we showed at Halai that have been excavated by the Via Faria Zenetica, most of the evidence is mid-fourth century. Uh, which corresponds, obviously, to the peak of occupation in Attica at that time. <clears throat> uh, we're not saying that we didn't have evidence of Agaraz before. They just tend to show up, you know, in the archaeological record at that time. So I would, if you ask me, I would tend to believe that we had Agarai before, obviously, uh, the fourth century. They just tend to show up, and they are probably more uniformed and better organized at that time, following perhaps also the development of Agaraz in the rest of the Greek world. Thank you. There's one online. There is. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for the online ones. No, go ahead. Oh, actually, you can read this. Yeah, uh, there's one actually here, um, which is great. You know, I've kind of half was expecting this. Um, Rush Arem from uh, Stanford University, um, who's done excellent work actually doing, uh, he, he actually, we read Greek tragedies, he actually puts them on. And this is uh, an excellent question. Um, it is interesting because, for instance, the uh, the theater at Thoracos has been thought to possibly double as an agora, and there's a recent book by Jess Paga who also sees a kind of possible connection between the deem theaters uh, and the agoras. We also must remember, we always think of production of uh, tragedies uh, and comedies as just taking place in the Dionysia, but there was actually a, uh, in about January, there was also, they took these uh, plays uh, on the road, and there was also, uh, again, another Dionysia in the fields, and they did definitely kind of uh, produce them out there. What they were using those spaces, again, in the time when they weren't being used uh, for theatrical performance, it may have been, again, that they were been doubled. So uh, Russia's question is it's very well uh, taken. Uh, and there, there may be uh, actually a connection. And what's interesting is a carry-on is obviously also thought to be a theatrical space, but it also looks that, it, again, it may be doubling again as a uh, commercial space. Good. Why don't we have someone? There was, there was somebody here in the audience, actually, who had a... Because we've got several online, which I'm happy to see. Okay. It's also... Um, uh, David Lewis, just a quick note on a Akarnai. Uh, Olson's article on charcoal production, and I think Douglas Olson is here uh, in the audience uh, tonight, um, uh, has some references in literary sources to uh, pack animals bringing charcoal to market in panniers. There's no indication of the target market, though, whether it's the deem or the city. That's absolutely true. Is Akarnai, getting back to that, is actually, of course, famous again uh, for uh, it's charcoal coming, charcoal being produced actually in a carni, but then probably coming uh, into the city. But then again, it also may have gone again as well to the other deems because charcoal is needed just about everywhere, and especially charcoals again needed in the mining district. Good. Other questions in the audience? And there's one there's more. One there. Lee Bryce. There's one there. What? Okay, there. Okay, good. Uh, I, good. I just want to weigh in and say. Um, Dikaiopolis isn't from Akarnai, right? The chorus is from Akarnai. The Akarnai, you're right. The, you're right. He is. The beginning doesn't actually help us to know whether it doesn't have anything to do with Akarnai. Yeah. You no, know, that's a good point. He just simply says he's talking about my deem in the countryside. Right. Right. Yeah, and it could be. You're absolutely right, Doug. It could be anywhere. Yeah, and um, the Akarnians, the Akarnians seem to talk among themselves as kind of a group. Right. You know, fellow Akarnians, they don't treat them as Akarnians. Okay. I can't remember if he's got deem. No, that's a good, that's a good point. I think that's it. I think okay. yeah, Lee Bryce had a quick question, but that's about it. I think we have said okay, good. I've, I've got question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You were using um, for property, and who buys property? Right. You were using deem affiliation as evidence for uh, residents. Residents and. That struck me as problematic. You probably thought about this, but can you say something about this? Because they don't automatically go together, right? So you could be from anywhere and live in any deem. That's, that is possible. That's a cautionary note. But the thing is, even if that's the case, you would just then, 
uh, the person, if he's not living actually in that deem, um, the, other, the, the question is, which other deem is he living in? And that's the only evidence. There seems to be a high correlation, not an absolute kind of correlation, um, but I think that's the best we can kind of, uh, again, that's, that is a, that's a cautionary note. But in that case, the deem that he actually is living in may even be further away than uh, was indicated uh, by his, uh, his demotic. But in certain cases, we actually, um, in certain cases, we actually do know where the people actually uh, are living. Good. The, case, the only, it's, it's curious because the case where we do know where people are living, medics are always listed where they're, it's oikon n or oikusa n, um, but they of course can't buy property, so that doesn't really help us. <laughs> Good. Oh, there's another. Oh, Yanis Lolos has got a question. I think I see. All right. right here. Wait a minute. So there's one question. Oh, uh, yes. In the room. Wait. There's one. Okay, good. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the differences between uh, like a civic or political agora versus the, the commercial one, or does such distinction between different types of agora really exist? Thank you. Hmm. You know, go, you go, you know. Well, I think we shouldn't separate them. I mean, you can have both in these public open spaces. Um, and in fact, we have evidence of both types of activities taking place in some of the Dimagara, as we showed. The one that's west of Sunyon is a good example with the two buildings, one more political in nature, the other one more commercial. And we have other evidence in the, in the Mesogea, Mirinus as well, where you have a part of the building or the agora space that seems to be related to you know, activity, political activities or civic activities of the deem, and then just in the same space, you have commercial exchanges taking place. So I would say both. Yeah, I mean, those are the, the students, as you remember, actually, we went to Thassos and uh, we had our, our long discussion, uh, again, the agora there. And again, there's a, there's a, re there's a combination of one, administrative activities. Um, we definitely have a, uh, offices, but we also have uh, evidence for commercial activities. In fact, there's a Zeus Agorayos, and we have a re religious. So this is, this is very typical. It's only later on um, where you start getting a kind of separation out. Um, and for instance, by the time, for instance, the Roman Empire, um, when you go um, to Philippi, uh, for instance, where you get a separate commercial agora and a separate kind of administrative agora, but that's a later kind of development. In the early period, in the classical period, uh, you, all the activities tend to be kind of put together. And then we have Yanis Lolos, and he actually does point out, which is a, an interesting fact, is some of these uh, agoras are actually kind of you know, closed spaces, or at least they have on three sides or four sides, as opposed to the Athenian agora in this period, which is actually an open space. Um, and that's what's interesting there is actually the, um, uh, the deem agoras uh, in that sense actually are kind of architecturally ahead actually of the uh, Athenian agora because of course we don't get an agora, we don't get a commercial agora until we get the Roman agora uh, in Athens actually in the first century BCE which is, takes that kind of standard form um, whereas actually again you have some of these uh, some of these deems at least are kind of architecturally kind of uh, precocious uh, in the sense that they're bordered on either three sides or uh, four sides. That's it. Thanks very much uh, Yanis. That's a, an excellent uh, that's an excellent um, observation. Good. <laughs> well, th thanks very much for a really provocative and, uh, and exciting talk. I had, um, and, and one of my questions play, uh, comes upon the heels of what you were just discussing, that the uh, um, Demagora looked more organized than the Athenian one, hmm. a little bit more like those in Ionia, um, mm -hmm. that uh, in terms of kind of a planned co concept, which made me wonder about two issues, one uh, related to, to scale um, and the other related to visibility. Uh, with visibility, I think you're seeing these, act, th these particular versions because they are architecturally distinct, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you probably have many more that are less distinct. Uh, and that, that's the scale issue. At what, at what point does something get to be a, a full agora? Can it be um, a pop-up agora? Uh, and <laughs> it's, you know, certain things come together at a, at a crossroads and are commercially viable. 
um, for a while? Is, does that count, or do you need to have you know a, a fuller set of services um, that are provided for it to be? Does it have to have a viability over time? I'm just curious about. Um, uh, what in the end will tip the balance between uh, something that's just a, uh, you know, a smaller center and something that can be officially called an agora? Yeah, I'll, I'll just Go start. Ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I think, what's the beginning point? What's the starting point of an agora? I think that you mentioned that it's the combination of several factors, but traffic is is essential, I think. And um, all the agoras we showed today are related to roads to, and many rescue excavations, you know, the effort finds a road next to the agora building of the deem. And when you put them together, you realize that they are at very important crossroads. So they remind us also of the, you know, the, you know, the medieval markets we had in, in Europe. Um, and you still have them here when you leave the cities and you go in the Eparchia, you, you have these markets at key places because of traffic. Traffic. So I think that they show up perhaps for this reason first, and then in the course of the fourth century and probably third too, they're more like institutionalized from an architectural point of view, and they're organized and rationally, you know, uh, set uh, together. And that's a trend we see elsewhere in Greece. If you go to Epirus, for example, you have all these Epirotic cities that show up and build an agora that look really much like the ones we see here in the fourth century. So that's a trend too. And we can think of Macedonia too with. Uh, um, you know, other big markets that we have there. So I think that probably in the course of the fourth and third century, these spaces became more organized with the shops. They tend, they exist already because of traffic, because of several factors, but they, they, they invest money and means in order to better make it more functional. And this is why we find latrines, restaurants, uh, shops. It's just more, you know, organized, I would say. There's another question. Yeah, so this is following up on Bana's question. Um, you know, Aristotle in the Ath Paul, he talks about market officials, um, but he seems to only say that they're in the in the agora, the central agora, um, and the and Piraeus, Right? It's kind of like five here, five there, five here, five there. What do you make of that? Because that would suggest maybe you've got some sort of sort of formal administrative lines between quote, real agoras that get this sort of city attention, and these others that somehow fall into a, into a different category. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The one thing is, we've obviously got official weights and measures, and the question is, who's got to, somebody's obviously got to keep these. And it's possible that uh, my uh, immediate uh, thought would be the DMARC, uh, is the one who's probably kind of possibly doubling um, out, you know, in Athens, you've got a big, large city, so you can actually have a lot of specialized kind of officials. When you're off in the deems, you're possibly going to have, you know, one official, you know, f having kind of several uh, roles. Uh, what's interesting in that that second century BCE inscription for Eleusis mm -hmm. does talk about a public slave being uh, at Eleusis and him actually keeping the weights. So in that that, that would be your answer for Eleusis. Whether it's similar case elsewhere, uh, I don't know. And obviously somebody is also collecting the tolls at Sunion, so that means we've got an official. Again, we don't, um, again, know. But we do know, again, they have demarks. And in certain cases, actually, in the deems, we also have evidence for treasurers. Uh, so these probably people are kind of doubling up on that. That's a good question. That's an excellent question, though, Doug. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to thank our speakers uh, very much for a really excellent and uh, wide-ranging talk. Uh, it took us all, all across all of Attica. And now I'd like to invite you all to come join us for a glass of wine down uh, downstairs so you have a chance to talk more informally with, uh, with the two speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you.